Well, I've uh, titled my presentation Local Energy Rules. Uh, it also happens to overlap with a new podcast that we're doing at ILSR. Uh, featuring community renewable energy projects, but basically it's this idea that we should focus on the policies that can overcome the barriers to community-based renewable energy. So I'm going to dive right in, give kind of an overview of where we're at with community renewable energy, why it's important, and some of the major barriers that we're experiencing to developing more community-based renewables. Um, so really, when I look at community renewable energy, I think of it as in terms of three, three locals. Uh, local and in terms of geography, that it's close to where people live and where people use energy, that it features local ownership, that people are able to uh, invest their own money and, uh, and have control over their energy future, and that it, of course, in order to be these two things, has to be at local scale, that it can't be uh, hundreds of megawatts in size as a power plant, that it would have to be a scale that is uh, compatible with community ownership. And unfortunately, right now, that's a fairly small fraction of our total overall renewable energy generation. Uh, there are about 67,000 megawatts of wind and solar power that have been deployed in the United States. And I use the figure of about 1% and maybe a little less is actually uh, owned under a community ownership model, in contrast to what we've seen in, in some other uh, communities and, and other states and other countries um, around the world. Um, but that's not to do. Uh, that's not because community renewable energy is inherently um, not uh, a good thing. Um, for one, it, it actually can really enhance the political popularity of renewable energy ge in general. Um, this is the results of a very interesting survey that was done a couple years ago, comparing two German towns, each that had a nearby wind farm. And in one case, that wind farm was locally owned, and in the, in the other case, it was not locally owned. And they surveyed residents of each of those towns and said, well, well, how do you feel about adding more wind power to your community? And as you can see in the results, the community that had a locally owned wind farm had a much stronger, uh, much more positive reaction toward the idea of doing an additional wind energy project. And, and I think in general, that we find that's true, that when people can have a stake in the renewable energy development that is in their community, can see those energy dollars cycling through their community, they're much more supportive of it. So it's, it's a political advantage. Uh, to have community-based renewable energy. Um, and it's also an economic advantage. Um, in a study done by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory looking at community-based and local ownership of renewable energy projects, they found that local ownership um, multiplies significantly the number of jobs that are created by renewable energy projects. And it also multiplies that total economic impact, the cycling of those energy dollars within the local community. So, Community renewable energy might be a small slice of the total renewable energy pie, um, but it's very advantageous to pursue in terms of policy. And unfortunately, there are a number of barriers, and I'm going to talk about uh, five barriers, I think, that there are in different sectors uh, to advancing more community-based renewable energy. And the first one is um, tradition. And this can really be summed up in a single slide, which is that we have sort of this transition happening right now um, in the utility sector, in the electricity sector, from a sort of a 20th century model of centralized power, centralized ownership and control of the electricity system, and also centralized generation and delivery of electricity to this model of clean local power. This was actually highlighted really nicely in a Green Tech Media article entitled Adapt or Die that was published a couple of weeks ago that was basically calling out utilities and saying, if you're not prepared to deal with what the grid of the 21st century is going to look like, uh, you're not going to be around. And the problem is that most utilities still see the system uh, and, and the policies in place as supporting their 20th century vision, and they haven't figured out yet how to adapt appropriately. So tradition can be a big barrier to community-based renewable energy simply because utilities aren't used to, think, to thinking in that frame. So tradition is barrier number one. Barrier number two uh, is this idea of raising capital to put money to, uh, you know, people bringing their money together to, to build something, I, you know, I can... It can't make it any more simple than on this slide. How can the folks that are standing under this uh, very interesting solar array buy that solar array? How can they own it? And raising capital, uh, the rules for that are, are governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission and their state-level equivalents. And I'm not going to go into a great level of detail, detail about what those rules are, but I'm going to highlight essentially the two problems that they present. Because um, the rules themselves are established for very good reasons, like preventing pyramid schemes and the Bernie Madoffs of the world from making away with our money. But the compliance costs necessary to participate, to, to create these kinds of offerings, to raise capital, are often very high. You can see that in the green box here um, uh, for these five different examples of 
uh, of ways to uh, organize people to raise capital. And on the next slide here, I've made another box that highlights what the restrictions are. So you have on the one hand very high costs for complying with the rules for um, raising capital for community energy, but then you also have these restrictions on what you can, what kind of investors you can invite in. So sometimes it might be that you can only really invite wealthy people to invest in your program. And in another case, it might be that the total amount that you're allowed to raise under that um, uh, regulation is limited significantly. Or it may be that you can only uh, have a conversation with people you already have a relationship with um, and cannot advertise more broadly. So all of these things create restrictions that make raising capital difficult um, in our economy. Um, we've written, I've written more about this, uh, but don't want to go into too much detail here, and folks can certainly read more on the slides uh, at a later time. Happy to take questions as well. So barriers one and two, we've got the tradition in the utility sector uh, and it's uh, focused on a more centralized system. We have the trouble with raising capital. Barrier number three, uh, I like to call this cash flow. And I think that this, uh, this chart is sort of illustrative of the issue. Um, I've gotten, for example, here uh, a commercial solar project in the state of Minnesota. And there are essentially four pots of money that this solar project needs to, to um, both identify and apply for and then bring in in order to make that project um, uh, to pay, make that project work financially. There's a federal tax credit, um, there's depreciation for, of that under federal accelerated depreciation rules, there's a state or a utility rebate, and then there's net metering. And all four of those things have to come together. And I think this slide pretty much sums up what that's like, especially for a community-based project that may not have specialized lawyers or, or folks working on this. There's a lot of paperwork to handle in order to do this kind of project. And that's in contrast to the policies that we see in other places, whether it's Germany and their feed-in tariff, uh, what we call sometimes in the United States a clean contract program, uh, Gainesville, Florida, uh, Fort Collins, Colorado is starting a program like this. It's a, basically ways to make it very easy for people to create uh, renewable energy projects and to figure out what their revenue stream is going to look like. Um, right now, that unfortunately under, for cash flow in the United States is a bit of a barrier. So we've got cash flow, we've got this idea of raising capital, we've got tradition as a barrier. Barrier number four is sort of the way that we structure legally our community-based renewable energy entities. And so I, I just like to ask this as a question, you know, which one of these makes sense in terms of being a way that you could aggregate a lot of folks in a community in a, in a legal structure to do a community-based renewable energy project? And the answer, of course, is all of them can make sense. All of them are ways in which communities, whether it's a geographic community or a community of interest, could come together to do that. Now, on the other hand, which one works the best? Which is the one that um, really enables us to solve some of those other barriers to community renewable energy? And it's kind of a trick question. The real answer is none of the above. And that's because um, we're going to, you know, visiting, uh, revisiting our cash flow discussion from earlier, we've got this commercial solar project. It's got these four different pots of money. But now we're going to organize under one of these legal structures that would really make sense for a community-based renewable energy project. Unfortunately, it means that we often have to introduce a middleman. So if we're doing a nonprofit model um, or you know, a city ownership model, we can't, we can't use the federal tax credit. We're not a taxable entity. So we have to introduce some sort of middleman, some sort of third party, and they're going to take their cut. And, and a lot of the evidence shows that that might be as much as half of the value of that tax credit. So there's this overhead associated with doing a community-based project that is not there for a commercial project. Or alternatively, if you don't want that middleman, you could simply give up the federal tax credit, which of course is giving up 30% of your revenue stream, for, for example, for a solar project. And so the legal organizations that would make the most sense for community-based renewable energy unfortunately don't allow us to overcome some of the other major barriers to community-based renewable energy. So let's talk about barrier number five, um, the last barrier. And this is um, a, the, the, what uh, I call the utility-based barrier. And I would encourage people not to read this entire thing. The infographic in all its glorious detail is up on our website at ILSR.org. But basically, the, the idea here is that utilities um, establish limits on the amount of distributed generation, small-scale renewable energy that can come onto their system. And the basic concept behind their limit is this safety margin. They never want more renewable energy produced in a local area than is consumed because they don't want that power to be able to flow out onto the rest of the grid because they designed it in a one-way direction. And there are some other issues there, but that's the basic concept. Well, the problem is that utilities don't actually measure how much we use 
um, on, on a certain part of the grid, especially the minimum amount, which is what matters. Because if we're talking about supplying more than there is demand, we need to know what our lowest demand is. But they think it's about 30% of the peak demand, which they do measure because that's how they determine, hey, we need a new power plant um, in order to meet this peak. So they take this 30% of peak, which they think is about right, and then they divide it by two for a safety margin. And so you get this default cap of 15% of peak power on a local power system is what's allowed um, in order for, in, for local-based renewable energy development. And that include community-based renewable energy and any other kind of uh, small-scale renewables. Now, the good news is there are states that are solving this policy problem, like Hawaii and California. Um, I would encourage you to you know, read more about that on our website. I, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but it's something that applies in most states, and it can be particularly problematic if you, ha for example, have one community with very good local policy that gets a lot of people investing in renewables. Um, they're going to hit this cap, even though the overall cap for you know, development of, of small-scale renewables uh, is nowhere near being hit. But speaking of that, this is a map right here that gives you a sense of what those overall limits are. This is the aggregate limits on total net metering. So the amount of electricity that can come from customers who are using net metering to connect to the grid, which is what most small-scale renewable energy projects use. Um, the red states have a limit of 1% or less of the total state's electricity sales can come from net metering projects. Uh, yellow states, that they have a limit as well, but it's higher than 1%. And then the states in gray have no no limit in law at all. Um, but you can see, unfortunately, there's a, there's a fairly good overlap with a lot of the states that have, uh, for example, a lot of solar and other small-scale renewables and having some sort of limit on the books. So those are the five barriers that we've got. We've got tradition, we've got raising capital, we have cash flow, we have the legal arrangement that we can use to do community renewable energy, and we have utility policies and other things. Let's talk about some of the solutions that can be done on a local level to solve some of these problems. Most people who are on this call have probably already heard of PACE or Property Assessed Clean Energy. The basic idea is let's make it really easy to do energy efficiency and local renewable energy by having a city-run program that kind of simplifies all of the different pieces and makes action very easy and that solves the financing misalignment. You know, Americans move on average once every five or six years. Financing a lot of these things takes a longer time period than that. What if we allow people to pay for these kinds of improvements to their property tax, pass those payments along, along with the benefits of whatever gets installed on the home, and, uh, and, and all of a sudden you're talking about a real opportunity. Unfortunately, there are a lot of barriers. Uh, there's a problem at the federal level, um, which I will not go into too much detail, that has really strongly curtailed the residential programs, but there are some really promising examples of commercial-based uh, PACE programs that are still in operation in Sonoma County, California, and other places. Um, another good local action is focusing on permitting. Um, Vote Solar and a number of others have really focused strongly on this so-called part of the so-called soft costs of solar. And what, what they found is that best practices in terms of making it very easy and streamlined to do uh, uh, local solar projects can significantly reduce the cost of doing solar and reading this chart from left to right, as the cost of solar goes down, the potential savings from implementing good local permitting policies rises significantly as a portion of the installed cost of that solar project. I've just got about three more things here. Um, franchise negotiation. Um, there's a campaign in Minneapolis. It's modeled on what has happened in Boulder, Colorado, which you'll hear a little bit more about later. Um, this idea is that utilities, even in a regulated state where they have a guaranteed monopoly, often sign these 20 or 30 year franchise contracts with the cities that they serve that govern the use of public right of way to deliver that energy service. These can't, contracts are up for renegotiation from time to time as they are in Minneapolis with the incumbent gas and electric utilities in the next couple of years. That's an opportunity to jump in and, um, and to try to make changes uh, about the energy future of that city to put things on the table like local energy production or, or clean energy. There's also this policy called municipal aggregation. I've got an asterisk here because only the states in color on this chart are ones that have a state law that authorizes this. But it's a really exciting opportunity, sort of a, a municipalization light, if you will, that gives cities the chance to choose their energy supplier, to negotiate on behalf of their small customers, um, to get better prices, and maybe even to encourage more development of local renewable energy. It's a concept that has a lot of promise, and there are over 300 communities in Illinois that have chosen to go this way in the past 
year and a half, um, but it's definitely something that is a little shorter of some of the more significant steps like municipalization that can accomplish a lot of local energy options. Um, I think this is my last example, but this is uh, municipalization. Obviously, you have some examples like Gainesville, Florida, where um, the local policy, because you get to set that at the local level, is very strongly supportive of community-based or, or local um, solar development. Um, you have the exciting results from Boulder in terms of their study uh, of the potential for municipalization, that they could get lower rates, better reliability, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and reach 54% renewable energy by switching to a municipal utility uh, from their incumbent Excel Energy. So some real possibilities there. It's a very long and complicated process, but at the same time, it is one of the, the powers that reside in most communities uh, to make a difference in their energy future. Ah, I lied. I have one more thing, and that's mandates. Lancaster, California has a great example. Um, they just implemented a building code standard that says that every time they have a new residential development, there has to be an average of one kilowatt of solar on each new house. So it doesn't have to be on every house, but it has to be that average the state of Hawaii has a solar hot water standard for every new house built. So there are opp opportunities in states that give locals, communities, the authority over buildings uh, to have some of those, uh, to make some of those differences, help over overcome some of those barriers to community renewable energy. So I'm going to leave it there. You can obviously find more information on our website um, or on uh, personal blog, energyselfreliantstates.org. And thank you so much.